there is a lot to go over in this unit and a lot of um, kind of small individual pieces that will tend to pop up uh, in the exam for a few marks. So the first thing is translators. Hopefully you'll all be familiar with the two different types of translators you need to know about and that is the interpreter and the compiler. Now they're both required because when we program we will program in high level languages which are very close to English like languages rather than programming in zeros and ones which would take absolute ages as well as trying to find and change errors would be absolutely crazy especially with the size of modern programs so what we have now is, is several programming languages of different types that are all known as high level where we use English like commands in order to program them but the processor that executes all the instructions that we create for it still works in binary, it still works in zeros and ones so we need to have ways in order to get that language into something the processor can understand and our choices are either an interpreter or a compiler now that's not to say that we'll choose either one and stick with it because in practice we use both and we use an interpreter whilst we're working on our programs whilst it's still in development and the reason for that is is because every time you put in an error whether it's intentional or accidental when an interpreter executes a program it takes one line of code at a time it tries to translate it and execute it if it can successfully execute that line it moves on to the next line and it'll repeat doing that until it gets to the end of the file if there are no errors which is great it's really good because the first error it comes across it will stop because it can't correctly execute that line of code which is really good whilst in development because you can spot the errors as you create them really so the interpreter is really really good for detecting errors the compiler's advantage is a bit different it translates one line of code at a time and executes that line of code the same as an interpreter the difference is is when there's any errors and any line of code won't execute with a compiler it just continues executing every line of code until the end of the program regardless of errors or not but the advantage of it is after it's been successfully compiled it creates an executable file which means the compiler is no longer needed in memory an interpreter it's constantly got to be run, running in memory if you're translating your program so in practice we use both of them so we use interpreters whilst we're developing our programs because it's easier to find errors and correct them and when we're finished our program we'll use compilers to create an executable file in order to completely finish with uh, the, the kind of software development environment what else do you need to know then uh, you need to know a lot about how binary is used in a computer system so hopefully you all have practiced how to represent an 8-bit integer and uh, you're, you're familiar with converting from binary to decimal and from decimal back to binary real numbers again just represented using binary in a computer system uh, what you may need to know is that it is represented using floating point representation that uses a mantissa to store the actual number it wants to represent now remember this is all zeros and ones a computer system has so it's got to store the actual number it needs to be represented and it uses an exponent to tell the computer how many places to float the decimal place from the front of the number and i think that's a bit more than you actually need to know at this level binary to store characters you may and hopefully have heard about ASCII code which is A-S-C-I-I -I, American Standard Code for Information Interchange which is a 7-bit code and it's extended to 8 bits to allow us to represent uh, characters in a computer system now what it's not great at is representing other languages which have a different alphabet uh, to ourselves and what we have is Unicode in that situation which is a 16-bit code which allows us to represent much more characters and therefore 
more languages. Uh, like we said earlier, for translators, every um, program we write is completely different from how the processor will see it. And it will see in individual instructions, which you can go away and do some reading on and look at different things of op codes and how registers are used in, within a processor. And hopefully this year you've learned about the fetch execute cycle and how the processor continually fetches instructions from memory that translates them and executes them using the different parts of the processor, which we'll cover in a minute. You also really need to know about uh, how um, binary is used to represent and store graphics. And this is a question that's quite often asked. The bitmap graphics, hopefully you're familiar with those from other videos where we've talked about standard file formats. And uh, you may be familiar with vector drawn packages, depending what um, you've done in other courses in school. Now, what you need to know is how bitmap graphics are stored. You also need to know how to calculate the file size of bitmap graphics, normally a three mark question that if you practice it enough, it's very straightforward. It's usually a simple multiplication and then dividing by eight and then divide by 1024 to convert it into bits, bytes, kilobytes, megabytes, whatever the question asks for. So bitmap graphics are stored by storing the color of every individual pixel in the image in a list. Now, if you to go away and open up a paint package and a bitmap and put one black pixel in the middle of the screen and had every other pixel left blank, it would take up the exact same amount of memory if you went back and drew the world's best picture in the package and saved it as well, as long as it was saved as a bitmap because it just remembers the color of every individual pixel. Vectors are really different and they store a list of all the objects which make up the image and they basically only have to store the attributes of all the objects that make up the image. So they'll store the actual shape that it is, the X and Y coordinates, the color, the line thickness and so on about every object that makes up an image. So depending on the file size vector or depending on the complexity of the image, vectors can be smaller. But for every object you add, the vector image size starts to increase. If you add more objects and change a bitmap image, the file size requirements remain the same. On the computer architecture part of this small unit, the first thing you need to know about is the processor and how it is the brain of the computer system. And it is the most important piece of hardware in a computer system. You need to know the three parts that make up the processor. So everyone in my class will hopefully remember, see you, I love you, right? To remember the three different parts that make up a processor. So the see you part of it represents the control unit. I love you represents the arithmetic logic unit and the R from right gives us registers. So you need to know at least the names of the three parts as well as the function that they carry out within the processor. So the control unit is in charge. I mentioned fetch execute cycle earlier. You'll probably learn more about that as you progress through the course. And its job is to make sure instructions are carried out in the correct order. And two particular instructions you'll learn about in future are a read operation and a write operation. And the control unit basically just ensures that those are carried out in the correct order making sure that the address register and the data register have data and so on and activating the correct lines of control. The arithmetic logic unit you can think of as like the calculator. Its job is to perform calculations and make comparisons based on logic. Now logic's all the things you've done hopefully in programming this year when you've used and, ors, not, greater than, less than, things like that to make comparisons. And the registers or where data is stored temporarily. So you think of that similar to RAM memory that's erased when the power is turned off. And the registers are used to store the results of calculations. They're used to store data. They're used to store addresses to be accessed and instructions. Other parts of computer architecture is memory. And there'll be another video that will talk more in depth about the different types of memory that comes in a computer system. But hopefully you know that computers have two types of main memory. They have random access memory, read-only memory, 
random access memory is temporary and read only memory is permanent and again there will be another video with a lot more information on that. What else do we need to know? We need to know about the data bus and address bus that I mentioned uh, earlier. The data bus, its job is to carry data from the processor to main memory as well as carrying data back from main memory to the processor whenever the control unit gives the command in order to do that. And the address bus, its job is to point at the memory location that's being accessed. So the address bus is a bit boring. It is unidirectional, only sends data out from the processor. Whereas the data bus has got a bit more of an exciting job and we call it bidirectional because its job is to carry data from the processor to main memory and it also has the exciting job of bringing memory back from main memory and into the processor. Interfaces, you're hopefully familiar with this word of looking at graphical user interfaces, human computer interfaces and so on. And these are required for all the peripheral devices that we use to control our computer system. And they have different functionality that they provide, such as protocol conversions, different devices um, will communicate in different ways and interfaces are used to translate it into something that the processor or other peripheral device can understand. We have data format conversion, which is really important, it's possibly one you're better to know. And that is where data is converted from analog to digital or digital to analog. For example, a microphone, it picks up the analog sound that we would speak and converts it into digital so it could be stored by a computer system. And then modern speakers will have, or will they'll use a digital to analog interface in order to play back the sound that's recorded. Uh, buffering is another function of an interface where it temporarily stores data, usually when a peripheral device is much slower than the processor. Uh, voltage conversion, another one, as well as handling the different status signals that peripheral devices have. But really what you need to know is interfaces are the hardware and software to allow communication between the processor and peripheral devices. So a lot in this unit, I really recommend doing a good bit of further reading and practicing how to represent binary numbers and how to do graphics calculations because those themselves are worth up to four marks if they both appear together.